Aloha. It's Wednesday. It's 11 o'clock. It's April the 7th, 2021. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host for What Now America? The title of today's show is President Biden's $2.3 trillion infrastructure plan. And uh, we're going to talk about the big plan. So uh, without further ado, let me go to my guests. Today, we have Jay Fidel, Winston Welch, and Stephanie Dalton. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Kim. You know, uh, Jay, there's been much to do about um, the other day when Joe Biden uh, announced his proposal about the infrastructure plan, and the GOP kind of went into a tizzy right off the bat. Uh, now, the GOP seems to have the traditional thought that infrastructure is just bridges and roads, and uh, that's about it. Um, the infrastructure of maybe some traffic lights. But the Democrats have a far different opinion about what, that sh what infrastructure should be uh, to include human in in infrastructure. So I think that's interesting. But you know, they're, um, they're not limiting it to just bridges and roads. They're including things of uh, housing, uh, replace lead water pipes, refurbishment of airports, federal buildings, they want to create jobs, raise wages, uh, benefits for home care workers, upgrade the electric grid, modernize schools, uh, install charging stations across America for uh, the onslaught of new electric cars. And uh, who's correct, Jay? What is the definition of, of, of infrastructure? Well, in 1938, the Republican position would have been correct. But we're a long way from that now. Our society is much more complex. And Everything you listed, in my view, is infrastructure. Um, and he's got to do that if he wants to satisfy you know, the various constituents of his party. Uh, if he wants to satisfy me, he's got to do that, I'll tell you. Um, but you know, the, the problem is that he's still got to get, even, even with all of that, he's still got to get 50 votes, uh, even with reconciliation, which is clearly, this is a reconciliation situation. He doesn't have to worry about 60 votes. He has to worry about 50, 51, uh, I mean, including Kamala. And um, so the problem is, I think some of the Democrats um, may have reservations about the definition you just described. Uh, and they may give him a hard time about it. If that's the case, he, he can't get that bill through. And this is a signature bill. It's really important. It's important to start the economy also, or restart the economy. This is a, you know, an FDR type of WPA type of bill. It has an effect in every corner of, of the economy and the country. Um, problem is that he can't be sure to get it through in his present form. Yeah. You know, you have to imagine that Ron Klain, you know, his chief of staff has a, has a blackboard in his office there, identifying every single member of the House and the Senate. Um, and they talk to them all day and they try to figure out which way these guys are going to vote. And I think they, they, have, they have found that they cannot get the 50 votes with the existing you know, bill. Um, so he has got to change a few things to get 50 votes. And that's why the paper this morning that's saying that Biden is now willing you know, to negotiate. I mean, the trap for him uh, negotiating with any, any Republican member of the Senate is that they'll do a flim flam on him. You know, they'll use it to deter and defer and make the whole thing go away. Uh, they've done that before. And well, they, play, they like to play out the clock. They, they're notorious for playing out the clock. Yeah, it's, it's an obvious strategy. Uh, and, and I'm sure he wants to avoid that. Uh, he'd like to avoid that, but he, he needs to talk to them now because he's got to get his 50 votes. And, um, you know, that, that means part of this bill is going to go away. I'm sorry to, I'm sorry to say. Yeah. I believe well, that know, all of it is appropriate, but part of it's going to go away. The more progressive uh, portion of the Democratic Party, obviously AOCs and and the and the Bernie Sanders, um, they feel that 2.3 trillion is woefully low. Uh, I, I I heard AOC on um, I think it was Rachel Maddow's show that she didn't think it was out of the, out of the reach or out of the, the plausibility of having a 12 trillion dollar package. Um, you know, just as a background, you know, we we've just spent five trillion dollars on the the three COVID relief packages. And don't forget about a couple of years prior to that is a multi-trillion dollar uh, corporate tax cut. You know, at some point, the deficit will catch up to us and uh, we'll see all sorts of havoc 
revealed as a, a result of uh, these crazy trillion dollar spending sprees that we seem to be going on. I, I totally agree. And, and the Republicans are playing on that. That's Mitch McConnell's you know, core point. We can't afford it. And uh, whether, whether he's consistent or not, I suggest he's not consistent. He's just a, a complete you know, you know, uh, political animal. Um, but but the fact is that that argument will resonate wider and wider as Biden spends more and more because it's you know it's going to catch some people's attention that we have to pay it back. Um, and right now it's already getting to that point I think with some people. Uh, how, where does this country go? I mean it's, it's the balance of we really need this to restart the economy. We have to spend. Let's not worry about it. And the other is let's worry about it because it, at the end of the day this is going to bite us in some way. And it, it always bites you to spend more than you have. You have to pay it back. Who is well, going to do I, that? I just don't think, now, I remember, don't think the, remember that bill calls for an increase in the corporate income tax. Correct. You know, by a substantial amount. I think it's, it goes from 22 to 28 percent, something along those lines. Um, that's a lot of money. And so, you know, at least he's addressing that issue. And he's satisfying the people who, like AOC, who wanted to tax the rich. Um, so, so, you know, that's a, a bit of an answer, but query whether it's enough. Okay. Hey, Jay, thank you. Hey, Winston, um, to you. You know, uh, the idea of this is most likely, as Jay said, it's going to be a reconciliate, budget reconciliation process. And the question being, is this going to be the last one that Joe Biden has for some time to come? And is this where you plant your flag to get this plus... I like, to re I like to refer to bills as kind of a Christmas tree, and everyone likes to put a big Christmas ornament on it. And as the ornaments are placed, the cost of the bill goes up and up. But is this, is this the bill where Joe Biden may have his last re really big hurrah for at least a year? Um, and that's why this, this is a $2.3 trillion bill? Or should it be even higher? Should it be a bigger one? Because he may not have another crack at this. What do you think, Winston? Well, I hope it's not the last major bill he has. He's got a lot of uh, stuff to do. This is just part of the backlog that he's addressing. Uh, you know, the voting voting rights stuff is is fundamentally more important. But this is what you, what was the phrase with Clinton what, uh, uh, and Bush Senior? It's the economy, stupid, right? Uh, which I thought was rude at the time, and I, I still do. But essentially, people vote with their feet. It, a lot of, uh, although these these last four years have turned everything on its head, because even though they may be better off, they're they're not voting rationally all the time. But this bill looks kind of like a hybrid between traditional infrastructure, where you would expect roads, bridges, and that sort of thing. Uh, but the interesting things thrown in there, where he's like Jay said, he's got to throw bones to his constituents, uh, but. 174 billion for electric vehicle stations. Um, is this not something that GM and Ford and uh, and Tesla could help pay for? It's interesting. He, this they're saying no. Nope, this is going to be on the backs of America. So put that in. 80 billion for Amtrak. How much is our train? 12. So you know you can see as soon as this stuff gets parceled out. And of course they're not spending what two billion here in, in in Hawaii. So that leaves 78 billion for the rest of the country. But other things that we think of, like um, bridges, roads, highways, in need of major repair. If you look at assessments of Hawaii's bridges and dams, a, a startlingly high number are in danger of, are, are at below grade. Um, you know, and, and we saw this in Florida this last week, where this, this massive wall of water might have come out of a dam. Um, the other things that he's thinking of doing is that I think probably is going to get the fat cut out of it is this idea like expanding high-speed broadband. Is this not something that the Verizon and T-Mobile and AT&T should be doing? Maybe not. They have the, have us pay for it. Um, and retrofitting 2 million homes and commercial properties, that seems like something where people will say, yeah, that's nice, but that's $200 billion that uh, you could spend somewhere else. The water, uh, the water pipes, the lead, that makes sense in the long run. Uh, you know, you want kids with lead in their brains don't do as well as Stephanie can attest as a teacher. Improving the electric grid, we know that we're one EMP away from, you know, disaster. So there's a lot of really good things in there. I think one that's really going to be cut is the yeah. caregivers 
for elderly and people with disabilities. That's four hundred billion, and I think that's going to be one that gets the biggest slice taken out of it. Frankly, the rest of it is supporting manufacturing and R and D, and you know, preventing future pandemics. No one's going to. Uh, I I would hope that they wouldn't fight that. Let me ask you this: What if you're one of the states that you know bit the bullet hard? You you taxed your local residents, your state residents, or even a municipality. And you said, we're going we're gonna to bite the boat. We've got lead water pipes. We're going to have to tear them all out and do the right thing and put in proper pipes. What if you're one of the states that did that versus one of the states that never bothered to do it? And now those states are getting basically a, a freebie for, for not doing the right thing back at the time when it was necessary. What do you say to those states? Um, well, yeah, I mean, it is it, at some level, someone's going to benefit somewhere. And I, I doubt, I hope that he didn't say he's just going to aid the blue states. I don't see that anywhere in here. Um, I mean, we know for sure Detroit had drinking water problems, but I don't think it was lead. But these are just human problems. The electric grid affects all of us. Texas being a, a prime example that, that we need to improve the electric grid and the way that, in that case, perhaps how the energy market functions. But they simply didn't plan on it being cold. So uh, I think the, a, a lot of these things are just basic catch up. And, and the way that he's going to pay for it and planning to pay for it, of course, is a, is a hike on taxes. You saw Janet Yellen saying something I thought which was quite interesting, which was the idea of floating a minimum international tax on corporations. So no matter where they were going, they can't hide anymore. And I think there's um, this is the idea that, the, that a corporation should pay something because so many corporations really just don't pay anything if they can avoid it. And you're seeing, you know, the EU sued Apple for locating in Ireland to avoid taxes and that sort of thing. So yeah. we'll see well, what happens. You know, Janet Yellen has that concept domestically, but also she wants to wrangle the G20 to do basically the same thing. And she's hoping that this, at least domestically, the corporate tax hike would raise about $1.3 trillion. Um, you know, not, not small change. So there'll be a question on to what degree corporations are going to support or not support. There are a lot of corporations saying it's time that we pay our fair share. Um, I don't know if that's Jeff Bezos or not, but uh, there are other corporations that don't pay taxes at all. And uh, well, I think they realize that the infrastructure is falling apart. That, that would be the hook in it. But I mean, essentially, remember that the job of a corporate head or he will be sued or she will be sued is to maximize shareholder wealth. And so if, if they're advocating for higher taxes on themselves, I would um, say they probably aren't doing their job to maximize shareholder wealth. Um, they might be good corporate citizens and they could approach it from that angle, but uh, I don't think you're gonna see anyone jumping in the aisles on the corporate end to raise their taxes any more than anyone else. Well, remember though, you guys, that, that um, some, of the, um, some of the infrastructure points could easily fall on these same corporations. Yes. And they're effectively being excused from, you know, huge expenses. So if, I were, if I were Ron, yeah, if I were Ron Klain, uh, I would go and say, yeah, we're raising corporate taxes. We have to do that. But we're also not pushing you on, for example, uh, broadband infrastructure. If you want to do that yourself, it's going to cost a lot of money. We're, we're taking your burden on that. So both sides, yes. there's both sides to that argument. Yeah, if they're putting in 500,000 charging stations for electrical vehicles. So like I said, is, should this be a Ford, Tesla, you know, or, or, or how about broadband internet? Apple is a, a $2 trillion corporation now. Uh, do you have an iPhone? That's it's some, they're getting subsidized by that. But we subsidize all kinds of industries all over the place. So this is nothing new. Yeah. It's okay. just how are we going to pay for it? All right. Thank you, Winston. Hey, Stephanie, um, Joe Biden got a little bit of a, I don't know if it's early birthday present or early Christmas president, but remember the um, Senate parliamentarian, the one that said, um, hey, you can't put in a wage hike with the COVID stimulus package. And Joe Biden uh, respected that opinion and, and therefore did not do it. Uh, that, that person is Elizabeth McDonough, McDowell. And um, she has basically said that Section 304 of the 1974 Budget Act allows the Senate to pass a resolution that revises an already passed budget. And by doing so, that gives you another, another budget reconciliation chit, if you will. 
Um, how many times can that be done? Uh, you know, Chuck Schumer didn't ask her and she didn't answer. But the bottom line is, if this is true, here's a backdoor way of really getting around the filibuster. And we could have now a whole host of things getting through the Senate that maybe previously was not possible. Uh, and I think, of, you know, I'm thinking of this infrastructure bill using the last uh, opportunity for a budget um, reconciliation process, but maybe there's more in the future. What do you think? Yeah, I've heard probably three, but I had heard before that there were two bef before this. Anyway, so it's it's tremendous opening of the gate. The drawbridge is down, okay, because the Republicans can't hold that. And um, if, if the Dems can come through on record. Do you think this is a misuse? Would this be perceived as a misuse of, um, of the bu budget reconciliation process? As is the filibuster is misused. If we're going to solve America's needs, if we're going to respond to the country's needs, which are dire, no. I mean, we, Biden's trying to find every way he can and making all efforts across all options. One of the things that you're pointing out that he seems to be doing, which is kind of curious, but is that he's maybe building this package based on the olden days, like the Eisenhower major highway program. Remember, we had all these highways because we all did pay for it, the, but Eisenhower was responsible for that. And now it looks like uh, Biden is doing that same kind of thing. So America builds its stuff, right? And then we figure out how to pay for it. But it uh, looks like maybe with the new roles for corporate America, this will stimulate some rethinking of how all that works. Plus, in listening to the Yellen and the other economic people, and I'm no economic, no economic person, but um, this doesn't necessarily come back on us. First of all, like I had thought would happen with Biden, it's like the shuttle's been sitting on, out on, you know, that Tower 8 waiting for the countdown and now finally biden's in and things are happening and now that shuttle's starting to uh, turn on all that smoke and rise for america and uh so this this is seems to be what's happening and we can pay for as i don't i think aoc is a little bit fringy but the point is that it's not just taxes that all this gets paid for we have debt. We have the 30 year treasury bond. We've got the most desirable debt in the entire world. They're all dying to get in here to have it. The Chinese own most of our 30 year bonds. And so when this happens, that's how we pay for this a, a big portion. And yeah, uh, but you're 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 basically putting the country in debt to a point where the country is no longer in charge of its own destiny. Your your borrowers of our debt they now start to push us around and tell us, this is how it's gonna go. And if you don't like it, we won't renew our, our 30 year treasury purchases of the yeah. United States treasuries. All, threat, all through the Biden, the Trump thing. Okay, I kept saying, you know, the Chinese do have their hand in our pocketbook. All they ever had to do was take it, say, that's it, we're done. And the next morning, all of us are out of money. All of us, you and me, no money, okay? So I never understood if he understood <laughs> what what a, a control factor there is for that but nevertheless this is an except this is the way uh countries manage uh to all right well let me ask you is is 2.3 trillion a bridge no pun intended a bridge too far is it too much or is it is it should it be more or is it you know should it be less i'm just glad that it's large because that gives biden a lot more maneuverability okay so if joe manchin wants 25% for corporates instead of 28, hey, yeah, let's go with that. You know, I mean, so I like that. Now, I, I don't know, the, I, I think the AOC thing, ultimately over four years, maybe we'll end up doing something like that. I mean, so that maybe that was her intention is the overarch issue, you know, of all that we need is hardly a, me a measly two trillion. Yeah, but you know, you could, you know, I, I understand negotiations, you ask more than what you wanted, what you expected, but at the same time, by throwing out landish numbers, you damage your credibility as not being an honest player at the table. Well, it all depends, you know, I mean, it's um, that that is standard negotiate operating procedure. And we have to watch our inflation and we have to see how our debt sells and how that we've got that those are all the things that Yellen and folks there take care of and look at, at how that works. Um, so 
uh, I don't think anybody expects that the first offer is the best and final offer. That's a that's just a major principle of contracting. You know, you're always going to come in and work it over. So I think that's an acceptable way to to approach it. And uh, I don't know how much Biden's uh, what margin he's left for himself, but you know he's on a, a razor thin uh, um, edge there. But hopefully, hopefully this this um, new way of seeing the corporations come in, and it, it doesn't look like Mitch Mitch is going to be that influential on you know what he's saying, especially since it's so hypocritical and he's done nothing but use them and they've paid him money. It's just been insane. So I mean, maybe we're going to get some transparency here on how these people have been operating in the Republican Party and not to the benefit of the nation. And here we've got to do this stuff or we're going to not make it to. Okay we want to be in yeah all right thank you uh you know you bring up mitch mcconnell and corporations and jay i'm going to switch switch uh, topics here and i'm going to give you a kind of a long long-winded question and that is going back to the georgia's uh, new voter laws that have been passed and signed into law by the governor are we're seeing a lot more corporations starting to take note of it and starting to speak out bank of america google facebook um the mlb of course has left uh for the um their, their games and Delta Air, of course. Uh, so they're starting to jump on board this topic. Yet Mitch McConnell comes out and says, hey, corporations, um, get your nose out of politics. Now, if I'm a CEO of one of those corporations he's talking to, whether he mentions my name or not, I guess I could take that and extrapolate to say, all right, I'll get out of politics. I'm not donating anymore. Can this, uh, back, can this have a backlash on the GOP by, by this issue alone? Mm, well, um, you know, as Winston said, they're, they're supposed to enhance the wealth of their stockholders. Um, anything that cuts their bottom line is a problem. Um, but as Stephanie said, you know, that Mitch McConnell is a very picture of hypocrisy when he gets there. Rachel Maddow last night made that so clear. You know, he's the one he's the one that, um, you know, is encouraging corporate contributions, doing everything he can. And then he says the corporations should stay out of politics. I, I think I think his hypocrisy is being revealed. I mean, no newscaster, no reporter is going to miss that point. He is, is a picture of hypocrisy. At the same time, you know, these these guys, why are these guys doing this? Well, they're doing this to enhance their brand with the public. I suppose you could say they're doing it for the right thing, but that's only one element. Um, they're, they're, they're doing it because it gives them good press. Um, and they're on a roll right now. Only the big ones that you hear about, I wonder about the medium-sized ones and the smaller ones, are they doing that too? They may not have the, you know, the financial clout to make a difference and leave Georgia. Bottom, bottom line is that this is the first time we have seen this, as I recall where a bunch of major national, international corporations have taken a position. And, and I think, it, it, it's, it's, I love it that they do this. I love it because they care about the people, or at least they do apparently. Their PR you know, firms are telling me they, they should take this position. And it will not be the last time. I think we've established a, a bit of a change in corporate culture here. And I'm so happy they got together. And I want I wanted to continue to do this and, stand up against McConnell. And I think they probably, at least a lot of them will, they'll continue to do this. Well, let me ask that point. Um, you know, there's Craig Manier. He's the CEO of Home Depot. Home Depot is uh, headquartered out of Atlanta. It's the largest employer in Georgia. Uh, crickets from Home Depot, absolute crickets. And if you go on social media, there are louder and louder shouts for boycotting Home Depot products. Stay out of the store. Uh, does Craig Manier listen to that? Or what would motivate him? Uh, he's a staunch GOP supporter. Uh, he has been uh, throughout the years, throughout the Trump administration and, and the George Bush Jr. administration. Uh, does it finally get to him? Uh, we go to Winston's point about it's their job to provide uh, you know, the stockholders their bottom line. But um, if he's surrounded by everyone that has jumped on board, is the pressure going to be so great that he has no choice? Well, that's another effect of the of the ones who are, um, you know, supporting the Voting Rights Act. Uh, 
and criticizing Georgia. I mean, they, they, they make it clear that Home Depot is crickets. They make it clear that Home Depot is not coming along. And, and that silence is deafening about Home Depot. And maybe it's just, you know, us guys here, but I take that really seriously. You know, there are alternatives to buying my hardware at Home Depot or somewhere else. Knowing that, Kim, Winston, Stephanie, I wouldn't buy anything at Home Depot. And furthermore, I'll tell you here now in public, I'm not going to buy anything at Home Depot. And I think, I think right-thinking Americans will hear the sound of those crickets and act accordingly. Those guys are definitely involved in politics. They're GOP. It goes, it goes beyond making contributions to McConnell and his friends. Uh, it, means, it means making a loud statement. They support what the legislature did in Georgia, and that sucks. All right. Well, just as a side note, the store in Honolulu, it's now referred to as numbers 1701, is the usually one, two, or three every year of the highest grossing sales store in the country. And um, just by the way, there happens to be a low store about three blocks away. So taking your point, Jay, and just making note that uh, there are other options. And by the way, our local city mail is just down the street from that too. So good point, Jay. Uh, Winston, to the same point and the same topic, should these, uh, will we see more corporations jump on board? And if so, why do you think they're doing so? Well, you know, I, I, although they do have the, their fiduciary responsibility to maximize shareholder wealth, they are also subject to pressures of their shareholders. And we see shareholders initiatives come in and say, we want you to whatever, uh, uh, switch to renewable energy or, or uh, purchase eco credits or, or whatever, or uh, make sure that you have the boardroom filled uh, with representational um, uh, members of society that, that look like society, um, they may require diversity and uh, inclusion initiatives. This may fall under this. This may fall under the, a mandate by the stockholders to be good corporate citizens in addition to maximizing their shareholder wealth. And in fact, it may be part of maximizing their shareholder wealth. So I think they probably look at all the calculus and they say, hey, does taking a position on this increase our shareholder wealth? If, if so, yes, it does. Therefore, we will take that stand. Um, uh, you know, I, I mean, it's very hard to prove something. People, are, are, they, are, are you going to have shareholders go to the Home Depot stock meeting and say, hey, you didn't take a stand on this, and the stock fell 10%, and there's a direct correlation there? It's hard to say that. Um, you know, one thing you have to look at, Winston, is, it's not just today or this week, or what the analysts are saying right now. If they enhance their brand, and you and I and Tim and, and Stephanie remember that, we're, we're not gonna be down on uh, Home Depot for a week or two or three. We will remember this for the rest of our lives. That's How much correct. is that worth to the stockholders? That, that is correct, and that's taken into the whole calculation of, of things. So I think at the end of the day, because of these pressures and because they don't want Major League Baseball or basketball or the NCAA or anybody else pulling out of there. And you saw, you saw even Stacey Abrams said, please don't leave Georgia. We need you here and keeping the pressure on, um, which I think was interesting too. So she said, we, we want to work with you guys to increase pressure to help our society be better. And so I think there's all these different factors playing in and it can be both better for the bottom line of the corporation to support these initiatives and be diverse and inclusive. And that actually is better for the bottom line. And I think most studies would prove that out. So, uh, you know, these boards of directors have these decisions to make and sometimes they're controlled by a bully or a major sh shareholder. And that's the reality of the situation. Well, you know, it has national effect and actually it's having a positive national effect, not only on guys like us, but the state of Kentucky is entertaining and may already have passed a pro-voting rights bill. A uh, pro-voting, that's news. And I, I guess what that means is they've been reading the paper. But what is also very ironic about it is, guess who is from Kentucky? Never mind. <laughs> Two of the worst senators. No, in the no coincidence there whatsoever. Hey, you know, we're running out of, we run out of time, basically. But... Unfortunately, one of the topics I wanted to talk about today, we'll have to just address it another time, is 
the fact that Donald Trump's uh, fundraising efforts has been splashed all over the newspaper and um, these campaign organizations have had to refund back to their donors $122 million because they donated once, but um, the forces to be continued to draw from their credit cards and their checking accounts and just suck them dry. And now the donors complained, wait a minute, I didn't agree to that. Uh, I agreed to pay $990, not $8,000. So this is happening all over the place, not just with a few donors, but thousands of donors. And it's totaling up 122 million. So uh, maybe next week we get to talk about this one because once again, be it Trump University or his foundation, his campaign do uh, organizations are on the move and scamming just like in the old days. So uh, last thoughts, Stephanie, you get uh, last thought here on stuff. I was just gonna say, Act Blue was into that too. So I mean, uh, the, I wouldn't, yeah, every, all of them have some problems that way and letting you slip into, oh, I'll, I'll be a, re a regular donor instead of just this one time. But anyway, so yeah, that, that was interesting, but it just uh, par for the course. I did wanna say uh, finally that um, to just uh, mention to you all that, and I think you all are discussing this and talking about it, is that there's a new paradigm I think that we're actually getting that. I guess that's what I'm trying to say about the, my satisfaction with how Biden is going so far. And that it, it is especially in the area of uh, opening up the thinking about all of this. I mean, it, Obama, you know, really rammed and rammed and rammed to work together with the Republicans. And he just got nowhere to the point where you think he just come running out of the White House saying, I can't take this anymore. But Biden is doing things that, probably having been informed from that, like he's got those posters all up telling everybody who did what, which is something Obama never did get enough credit out there about who did what for uh, the health care. But anyway, the point is that I think Biden may have something going here with cracking through the, the current paradigm that's got us in this iron grip stalemate. And let's just see if he's going to continue to run with this ball or get, get better at it. Going to have to get Alrighty. better at it. Okay, yeah. thank you okay. for those last comments. And Thanks. Yeah, good words. Hey, Jay, uh, your last comments be about infrastructure or anything that suits your fancy. Well, I, I, returning to your point about how uh, Trump scammed um, his uh, public, you know, it's done with little boxes, pre checked boxes. That's little right. A box in the middle of the boilerplate says, uh, I agree to give this uh, for, um, you know, for the rest of my life, something <laughs> on a weekly <laughs> basis. And they accelerated that. You know, first it was by the month, and it was by the week, and by the hour. And, and then they had this something called a money bomb. <clears throat> and a money bomb is another little, a, a second little box that says, in addition to what I told you I was giving, um, I'm, I'm going to give a $1,000. And people wouldn't see that. And they got ripped. And, and the Trump campaign, and by the way, the uh, Leffler, and who, the, uh, who was the other one who was running um, in Georgia, running for the Senate? Those guys use this technique the same way. They raise tons of money. Um, and and it's, it's a GOP trick. And yes, Stephanie, the, the Democrats had to return, refund money too. They all, they all do. But the amount of money that Trump collected was huge. Millions, millions, ten, way tens of millions because of these little boxes. And it's a scam and everybody knows it's a scam. And they refunded it. But here's, 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 the, here's the bottom line. It's a tax, or rather an interest-free loan. So if you need the money to run your campaign for, say, six months, yeah, you take the money, you rip everybody off, you use the money, and later on, presumably after you've won the campaign, you refund the money. It's an old-fashioned scam. Wow. New, uh, a new light on an no. old subject. <laughs> All right, thanks, Jay. Uh, Winston, your last thoughts, your last words. I don't, just hearing his name uh, made my brain fry, and I'm so glad we don't talk about him anymore, honestly. Uh, it, we have so many important things to discuss, and him not being part of the conversation is so healthy for all of us. I mean, he's there in the background, but uh, at this point, uh, I'm just grateful that, that we've moved on as a people, and that we're moving on, and... Um, God bless America and God Joe Biden. All right. <laughs> Great words to end with. Thanks, Winston.
All right. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. I want to thank Jay Fidel, Winston Welch, Stephanie Dalton. Thank you for joining us on What Now America. Uh, join us next week, Wednesday at 11 o'clock. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host, and we'll see you then. Aloha.